Hi everyone, Chris here with a gaming laptop that I took a bit of a risk on getting, a bit of a gamble here because it's a brand that I've never covered before in the channel. It is the Thunder Robot 911MT. Now Thunder Robot, apparently they're quite popular in China, but I've never tested their gaming laptop, laptops before. This one has a 15.6 inch screen, 144 hertz. It's powered by a Tiger Lake, a Core i7. It is the 11800H with eight cores and it does have a 512 gigabyte NVMe drive in this, and a 144 hertz, 15.6 inch screen. So let's get this open and find out whether or not this gaming laptop's any good. So it is factory sealed from Banggood. Normally they do actually open up a lot of the stuff they send out, and not this time around. So when I bought it, it was just under, a thousand euros, or it was about 900 and something euros, which I don't think is too bad of a price, uh, considering the spec of it. Although the RTX 3050 is not exactly a super potent uh, GPU. So here we have their funny looking robot or Mandalorian type mask face logo. That is the, the robot guy there, obviously. And it, well, it doesn't have a seal right here, so we can get straight into this and take a look what we've got. So there it is, nicely padded, protected, and there's just a whole bunch of information about the laptop there that they have included. Uh, don't need really that, it's pretty straightforward here. So power supply, oh wow, I did not expect it to be this small. This thing is absolutely tiny. So this power supply 150 watts because the RTX doesn't actually need a lot of power, the RTX 3050 that is, only needs about 75 watts of power. So that, oh that's all sealed there. Look at the size of it, very good. So two power cables here, this is a UK one, UK plug, and we do have the Australian New Zealand plug and the one they also use in China. But they have included adapters here for Europe and another one there for the US, which is great. And what else is in here? This, I don't know, ah, oh, removable battery. Okay, I did not expect this. I mean, look at how small that is. 41 watt hours, that's ridiculous for a gaming laptop. But normally gaming laptops, you use them plugged in, so that really doesn't bother me too much. But it's been so long since I have seen a removable battery in a laptop. So here we go, there's a bit of paperwork here and a blank plastic SD card if we needed that, and some screws. I'm not too sure why we need those screws, but that could be for adding an additional NVMe drive. I hope it does actually take a few more. So the weight of it, I'll check that out in a second. It does feel really quite light. I can see intake vents here along the bottom, okay? And if you up the front, downwards firing speakers either side. I'll give you a sample of how those do sound in this hands-on video. So the lid here, this is brushed metal look to it with the logo again, which doesn't look too offensive there. So let's lift this up, take a look at the keyboard. Now this keyboard looks very similar to ones I have seen, say from uh, Clevo or the Sager machines, Tongfang, similar kind of layout. This is an RGB keyboard too. So just an initial first look here at this keyboard. Layout doesn't seem too bad, so this is the US ANSI layout, shift key on the left here, a little bit larger. Now pressing down around the K and L keys, and even around, where you'll be using it for the gaming, the WASD keys there, it's got a little bit of flex to it, definitely if I push down really hard. Bit spongy here, right in the middle, around the H key actually, and full size number pad there too. So this is a textured material to imitate metal on the palm rest, but no, that is definitely not metal. This is plastic right here. It's just the lid that has the metal. And the touchpad size doesn't seem bad. Clicky, cheaper feeling kind of left and right mouse buttons. A lot of stickers on it, you can see. So the 11th gen Core i7, and we've got the GeForce RTX, Sound Blaster 6 Cinema sticker there too as well, and Windows. And our screen here, so we've got a 15.6 inch 1080p panel on this 144 hertz. Camera up the top, I believe is HD. There's some little rubber pads here around the outside of the bezel. This bezel is plastic, it's matte. The hinge goes back, that's the furthest right there. Doesn't have a bad feel to it. Now, can you open it up one-handed? Uh, no, you can't, all right? 
A lot of people always ask me that. I don't know why it's a bit of a silly question. And then we've got the Thunder Robot branding right here. And the bottom bezel is huge. Left and right and top bezels, they're not bad. For ports here on the left, we've got an exit vent for the fans for the cooling on this. I'll go over the fan noise uh, in this video, or maybe if I do a full review. Kensington lock slot, USB 3.1, and we do have USB 2. Separate audio jacks there, 3.5 millimeter. And ports on the back, so the barrel DC in for powering it, of course. Gigabit LAN, HDMI 2.0, so not HDMI 2.1, which is a shame. Display port, which is mini display port, this one, 1 1.0. 3 spec, so it's 4K 60, and here is an exit vent. This is not actually an exit vent at all. This is just for aesthetics to make it look the same that we've got one either side, because of course the battery is right here. That's venting nothing. Now, what about the weight? It actually feels not too bad for a gaming laptop, and I'll just measure it. Total travel weight, of course. So here we have about 1.9 kilos, I think for the spec of this laptop. That's not too bad, but that is not a total travel weight, of course. The tiny little power supply plus the power supply cable brings the total travel weight up to then 2.4 kilos, which is, well, that's kind of standard, I think, for a 15-inch gaming laptop. Now we're talking here with upgrades, very good with this particular laptop. So we can swap out the wireless card. You can add an Intel AX201, which I highly recommend. Add a 2.5 inch spindle or SSD drive, and you can add an additional NVMe right here. So that means we can add an additional two drives, which I really like to see. This is great. And this is probably why we have such a tiny battery in this because they've added the 2.5 inch drive, which now we don't normally actually see. So you can also swap out the RAM very easily. Both of the sodium slots are right here. And our copper transfer pipes here. So we've got a traditional sit setup here. It's not vapor chamber. They're not using liquid metal thermal pasters on here. So right here we have our CPU. I can just see it. This is that 11800H, the eight cores. This right here is the cooling side for the GPU, which is that RTX 3050. The layout and everything here is quite good, and it really does remind me of MSI laptops that I used to review quite a few years back. It's very, very similar, the layout, the plastics used, and the quality. So right down here, we've got our two little downwards firing speakers. They have a little bit of a chamber to them. Here is a sample of how they sound. Okay, so nothing amazing, standard really laptop speakers. They are lacking in bass, and these ones aren't that loud. They could definitely be a lot louder. And our BIOS here, so it is using an inside BIOS, which has the visual BIOS presentation here at the front here. It's called the H2 BIOS, and under setup utility, there's our, well, administrator, secure boot stuff you can do here, boot from a file, boot manager. But I'll go into the setup utility and hopefully we're gonna get some of those typical advanced settings here. You can see there the processor, so the i7 11800H. So that's got a maximum turbo of 4.6 gigahertz and eight cores. It's quite potent and I'll show you benchmarks of that shortly. Uh, under advanced settings, this is the one I wanna take a look at, advanced chipset control. So there hopefully is gonna be a few things we can tweak in here. Uh, not really, AC fan control disabled, so flexi charger disabled. Okay, so it can charge over the USB ports, I guess. Oh no, hang on, flexi charger to enable, over time the battery meters reading accurately deteriorate. So what that is, that is doing is like other manufacturers like MSI that hopefully doesn't fully charge the battery. So that's a handy thing because it's got such a tiny little battery in here. Uh, AC fan control, what's this about? That's all disabled, so really not a lot that we can mess about with in here, basically nothing. So that's a little disappointing that the BIOS does seem to be locked down to us. Get out of this and we'll jump into Windows. Now the memory on this one, dual channel, it is running at 3.2 gigahertz, and of course you can upgrade this sodium slot, so you could add up to 64 gigabytes if you wanted to in this particular machine, and Windows 10 Pro and it does have proper activation. So it is a digital valid license that they are using with this. So that is another positive. Now the screen so far, this is just first impressions 
for what it is, it's not too bad. Now, I need to measure it, of course, the color, gamut, coverage, and brightness, and everything. But so far indoors, it is looking like it's living up to that 300 nits, and the coverage and all that, I will need to cover that, of course, probably in another video. If there is interest in this particular laptop, there is. So under device manager here, just wanted to point out a few other things, and that is that the disk drive, so this one, the SSD, PCIe 3 spec, I'm not too sure if this slot's actually going to support PCIe 4, which of course the chipset does. Uh, I don't know the brand of it because it's a triple S TC CL1 512 gigabytes, and these are the speeds of it. So it's okay. I mean, this is definitely a lot faster than SATA 3. However, it's not the fastest PCIe that you will find out there, but I guess for the price of the system, it's to be expected. Now, a wireless card here. We've got the wireless AC 9560. Okay, so not wireless AX, but you could swap that out and install, for example, the AX201, which does have Bluetooth 5. That's well over gigabit speeds, that card, and I do highly recommend it if you want to improve on your wireless speed and performance. The LAN port gigabit, that's real tech. And of course, a processor that shows up 16 times because it's eight cores, 16 threads. So yes, it's quite a monster. And I do have a couple of benchmarks for you. So the Cinebench score here, R23, no tweaks to power limits, no undervolting either. We're getting just over 10,000 points, which is 10,607. Now, if you do undervolt, I know this from my MSI that I own with the same chipset, you can sometimes get up to around 13, even 14,000 points with faster RAM timings as well, which this doesn't have. I believe it's running CL22, so it's not exactly amazing. You could swap it out, put faster RAM in, really boost up those speeds. So then just here is our Geekbench. Five score, which is solid. I mean, look at that multi-core score. That's nearing up to 10,000 points. Highest I have seen is over 10,000. And the single core score there, uh, very good. These are excellent results. Uh, this chipset is an absolute monster. And for the price of it, the performance is good. So, so far, the fan has been really quite tame. And I've only heard it come on when running Cinebench. That was really the only time. So the included software, nothing with Windows here. It's stock standard windows. They haven't put any bloatware, any stupid uh, antivirus programs on of their own, none of that. But if you want the control center and control of the keyboard lighting, the RGB colors, then you do need to go onto their website and download all of the drivers here, which are under their website, which is thunderrobot.com. Now I decided to see how far I could actually push this chipset. I've overclocked and undervolted it a little bit with Intel's XTU. And right here, I've got a Cinebench score of over 14,000 points. And yes, the minimum test duration is off because I wanted a quick test. I don't want to have to wait 10 minutes every time I tweak these settings. So what I did was just undervolt 0.070 on the core and the cache. And then I did an overclock. So under core here, I simply set this to be a little bit higher under the multipliers. So with the Tiger Lake, Intel now lets us overclock by four multipliers on even the H series. So it doesn't have to be an HK chip, just on the H series, we can do this. So I added an extra three to the multiplier, and then I also did add a higher power limit. So I changed this. So this is what MSI has by stock. They have 200 watts for PL1 and PL2, and I've changed both of them. And that's how I got that result there, which is, I think, really quite important. It's an absolute monster of a chipset once you undervolt it and overclock it a little bit. And a quick 3D mark benchmark here. This one's time spy just to really see what that RTX 3050 can do. Thermals when gaming seem to be great, and I'll show you the end result of this, but also a little bit of gaming too. All right, just finishing up now, let's have a look. Okay, so very good CPU score there, graphics score almost 4,800, uh, which is not too bad there. And then the total score for an RTX 3050. You gotta remember, this is the low end 3000 series card for laptops. That's not actually too bad. Then the Fire Strike score, so this is just the normal Fire Strike. We get almost 12,000 points here, which is again not bad considering it's an RTX. 3050. 
And then some actual games. So this is Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and you can see so far stable, good playable frame rate at the high setting. And the thermals are good. It normally stays around 75, mid 70s when you're gaming. Let's take a look at the end result. 78 average frames per second on the high setting preset. I don't think that's too bad at all. So it's a capable 1080p gamer, but let's step it up now to Cyberpunk 2077. All right, so this is actually looking pretty good. 80 frames per second, medium preset, and I do have it set to uh, DLSS on, on the auto preset, so 60 frames per second. But being able to play a demanding game like this with a, well, a playable frame rate here is looking very, very good. So just get out of the car, quick little run around. Nope, no, I don't want to be in that mode, hang on. Good, very good. So yes, as mentioned before, it is a capable 1080p gamer here. If that's all you plan to do. If you do connect this up to an external monitor and you want to run, say, a 1440p display, because of the four gigabytes of RAM, I do believe you might run into some performance issues, uh, especially with a game like this one right here. Now, I did break out my Spider 5 Pro to take a look at the screen, and it's not a very good screen at all. In fact, it's terrible. Adobe, you can see here, 46% coverage. That's not good, so not for professional use. And what about the other levels here? So NTSC, that is 44%, and then we have 62% sRGB. Ouch. So the 144 hertz is great, but then the color coverage of this panel, terrible. Maximum thermals are 92 degrees Celsius. Ambient temperatures in this room currently 25, 26 degrees here. So it did actually trigger thermal throttling. And it pulled in total the maximum system power well, from the chipset power, package power here, about 95 watts. So they do have a higher power limit set there. And if you can tweak that with Intel's XTU, you could probably boost up the scores a little bit, but really we don't have any thermal headroom for this because it's already reaching 92 degrees C, which is standard and common really for this chipset in my MSI GP66 10UG model, it hits these temperatures. And the thermal, so gaming now, one hour of Cyberpunk, you can see just above the keyboard there, there's a hot patch which is getting up to around about 50 degrees Celsius, just near the power button as well. But the palm rest and your WASD keys, the touchpad do remain cool. Okay, so there are a lot of things I like about this particular laptop. Some surprises. I love the fact that we can put in a 2.5 inch drive. It takes another NVMe drive. Sadly, I don't have a spare PCIe 4 drive to test out if it's going to work in here because it does support PCI4, uh, the new chipset, Tiger Lake, but the drives, I don't know whether the actual slot does. So if I find some time, I can rip it out of my tower PC and put it into this and let you know in the comments. So the build quality, while it is all plasticky, I don't mind the materials used on the top. I think the weight is okay. The touchpad's not too bad, but I wouldn't rate it as being amazing. Keyboard, good to type on, but a little bit spongy around the middle there. That's one thing. Now, if you want the RGB, you want to change the colors, you will actually need to install their software. So it comes with Windows 10 Pro. The screen, as I pointed out, 144 hertz. Response time seemed fine to me, but the color coverage is bad. 46% sRGB, well, Adobe RGB, sorry. Not great, all right? So for creators, professional work, editing photos, videos, no. You don't want a screen like that, you'd have to hook up an external monitor. Now, performance-wise, for gaming, all 1080p games, gaming at 1080p, sorry, Great, I think it's good. It's all playable frame rates. You could even play demanding titles uh, like Cyberpunk 2077 that I showed you. As long as you enable the DLSS, you get a very respectable good frame rate there. It supports the ray tracing. However, Nvidia kind of crippled this card. Only four gigabytes of dedicated RAM. It should really have six. So that's where it comes to a bit of a tough area because the RTX 3060 is probably the graphics you want to get in the gaming laptop. However, most other gaming laptops that have that chip will have then only the quad core. So they have a step down in terms of the CPU performance because the CPU in this, the Tiger Lake 11800H, once you undervolt, it's an absolute monster. You can overclock it a little bit and you get Cinebench R23 scores that are equal to, to or around about the same speed 
of say a Ryzen 9 5900HX. So that is impressive. You can get some really good performance out of it. So adding the extra storage options on this is good. It's got a very tiny little battery in here. So 41 watt hours. It's gaming wise, it's about an hour. It just burns through that battery. Now, if you force it onto the integrated graphics instead of the NVIDIA graphics, then you can squeeze out maybe two and a half hours. It's really not all about the battery life on this. Not really a portable machine. It's basically having a UPS, an, an uninterrupted power supply in it because of the battery. When you move it from one area to another, it's not gonna power down, but battery life is terrible. So the quality, I think, overall very good. It is a Tong Fang Clevo ODM machine that's been rebranded and it's not too bad. So we've got the logo on the back here, the metal at least here, and the rest of the frame, the build quality seems fairly decent. I do like the materials they have used, this plastic on the top here. Even though it's not metal, it imitates it, it feels nice and smooth. Touchpad's okay, keyboard's good to type on. Pricing wise, so I paid 920 euros for this. If I'd spent an extra about 150 euros, I could have picked up, for example, the Tough T15, I think it is. And that's got the RTX 3060. It was really the GPU you probably actually want, but it has the quad-core chip, a much weaker CPU, but still for gaming, I think it's adequate, it's fine. Or the Lenovo, the Legion 5. The Legion 5 is an extra about 400 or 350 euros more than this, but you get again, you get a very potent chip in it. You do get the RTX 3060 graphics, which is better than the 3050 here, which still I think for 1080p gaming, as mentioned, is perfectly fine. So I think not a bad laptop all up, but you probably might be better off getting that RTX 3060. 60 machine if you can with the six gigabytes of dedicated RAM instead of the four. Nvidia crippled it, but it is what it is. I do actually like this. The performance from the CPU is really, really good. It's an absolute monster, this machine. So thank you so much for watching this. First impressions, well, basically turned into a review here of the 911 MT from Thunder Robot.